If we've learned anything this year, it's the importance of soap and supporting small American businesses that keep our economy going. That's why we're introducing Hero Soap Company, a brand that pays homage to the values our country was founded on. With a U.S. Air Force veteran as an owner, Hero Soap Company understands the dedication and sacrifice each family makes to serve. Handmade in Phoenix, Arizona, each bar of Hero Soap is crafted with ingredients sourced from U.S. companies and is free of chemicals, dyes, fragrances, and parabens. Go to HeroSoapCompany.com to subscribe for a 20% saving and have soaps delivered every month. Order any number of soaps in your subscription, and Hero Soap Company will send a one-time matching number of soaps to the troops. Plus, a portion of every sale is donated to charities that help veterans and first responders, including Operation Finally Home. Use promo code DANA at checkout and save 10% on all non-subscription orders. Suds up with the Hero Soap Company. Promo code DANA. Veterans Chronicles is sponsored by the State of Cutter representing Cutter's commitment to the U.S. Hi, I'm Greg Corumbus. Our guest on Veterans Chronicles is Teeley Fred Harvey. He is a U.S. Marine Corps veteran of World War II and the Battle of Iwo Jima. And sir, thank you very much for being with us. Well, it's an honor. Where were you born and raised, sir? I was born on the railroad tracks in Memphis, Texas in 1923. I lived there for three days, then my folks moved the tent into San Antonio, and we stayed there for a while. When did you join the service? In the fall of 1942. Why did you choose the Marine Corps? Well, I'd always admired the Marines, and so I just joined me. I quit school because I couldn't pass English and, well, other subjects also. So I just decided to join the Marine Corps after I quit school and uh, wound up at boot camp in San Diego, opted to go into the paramarines, and I was accepted by them and trained in Camp Gillespie in the outskirts of San Diego. And once you were trained, where did they send you? After I was trained, I was put on a a ship that wasn't fit to be floating. It was a Dutch ship called the Bloemfontein. The Bloemfontein hauled cattle from Australia to parts of Java in the Dutch East Indies. And when the war broke out, uh, the captain of the uh, ship, the Bloemfontein, was carrying a load of Johnson rifles for the Dutch. When the war broke out, they turned around and headed back to San Francisco. There he gave the Johnson rifle to the Marine Corps. The Army rejected them, and so the Marine Corps took them. And that was my first weapon, was the Johnson rifle. I took paratroop training, took my six jumps, and made three other jumps other than that. And... uh, I went overseas, and I was attached to the 1st Parachute Battalion, and our first invasion was a small island called Vela La Vela. That's where I saw my first action. We stayed there about four weeks, I guess. What we were doing, we were island, island hopping at that time. We'd take an island, the sea bees, would come in and build airstrips to use to take the next island. It was island hopping. And so the Seabees and the Marines got along real well. The average age, we found out at that time that the average age of a Seabee was 36 years of age 
and the Marines average age was 21. So they took us on like, like a bunch of children, I guess, and we loved the CBs, and I guess they really liked us because they took care of us. Where did you see action next? The next time we went over to Bougainville, and we were there during the campaign, and uh, then when we finished up there, they decided to break up the paratroopers, Marine paratroopers, that is, because it wasn't feasible to them to jump us in the jungles. The only jumping we did as paratroopers was jump off of LSTs into Higgins boats and then jump off of Higgins boats on, a couple, on islands. And uh, when they broke up the paratroopers, they assigned us to the 5th Division. We trained a little bit, then moved to Hawaii and trained there. In Hawaii, I was branded a coward because we'd be walking along, training and so forth, and I'd just fall over and faint. They rushed me to the aid station. And they never could find anything wrong with me, so they put me back into action. We was out again. I fell over, just couldn't get up or anything. So they decided to send me to an army hospital they got me down there, and they decided that there was nothing really wrong with me, that I just didn't want to go back into action. Well, I cried. I cried because I couldn't figure out what was wrong with me, and I surely didn't want to be discharged from the Marine Corps. And that went on a couple of times, and then... The Army psychiatrist at that hospital, he said, well, I'm writing you up for a discharge. Well, my buddy, Lee Carbadart, he was another Marine, and he and I were real close. He came to the hospital, and uh, he walked me back to the base and uh, with my pajamas on. Then he sent another guy down, Bill Cross, to get my shoes and my gear from, from the hospital. Well, the next morning, I was sick again, so he took me over to the first aid station of their own base. And they checked me out, and they couldn't find anything wrong with me. Then a young doctor said, Harvey, which islands were you on? when you were over here before. And I told him, Villa La Vela and Bougainville. And when I said Bougainville, he said, I think I know what's wrong with you. He said, I'm taking you down to that army hospital and we're gonna make some, take some tests on you. So when I got down there, they put me in the room and then gave me Felt like, looked like a handful of pills. And I took those pills, and what they were was just something to make my bowel movements. And sure enough, within about an hour, I had one of the biggest bowel movements you could ever see. And they'd put me on a bedpan to capture that. And they showed me in that bedpan, it was just covered with worms. And the doctor said, these are hookworms. He said, when you said you were on Bougainville, I had an idea that you might have gotten that hookworm some way. He said, did you go barefooted a lot there? And I said, I spent a lot of time barefooting after we settled with the land that we needed to make an airstrip out of it. He said, well, when you walked on the ground, in those jungle areas, palm tree areas and so forth, you picked up hookworms and it worked through your feet into your bloodstream. After that, I never had another attack. It was a blood, uh, the hookworm that was giving me the problems. Wow. 
Wow. Yeah. All right, well, let's talk about the Battle of Iwo Jima. Tell me about coming ashore. Well, I was a demolition expert in the uh, Battle of Iwo Jima, and uh, I was attached to uh, the assault squad. That In those days, we had one assault squad. It was a bazooka and his uh, assistant, and then TNT, I was a demolition man, and then we had the flamethrower and so forth. And we trained with the re rest of the tro uh, company, and we'd come to an area that needed to be cleared out. Usually it was a uh, concrete uh, embankment and so forth. So we trained, and that's the way we attacked. Uh, a lot of people talk about the raising of the flag on Iwo Jima. And everybody, every man you saw it said, oh, I was there. And I'd always tell them I was the only guy that didn't raise the flag on Iwo Jima. I was down there just right close to the base of that mountain. And I was carrying a satchel charge on the end of a long piece of wood and I was going to put it into the uh, in front of the cave that had a steel door in front of it. Well, as I was working my way up to it, the rest of the platoon would be taking care of snipers and giving me instructions as to what was happening for. So I went around the edge of a big, big rock, and they hollered at me. Harvey, Harvey, got a guy coming at you. Look at him. And I dropped that stick right there and turned around, and I had a forty-five pistol and just shot, hit him right in the belly. Now, I was in a lot of action. That's the first enemy that I killed. And I said, that was my kill. Because, like, when we'd meet somebody else, maybe five or six of us would be shooting at the same target. But... I, I shot him, and uh, then we looked at his weapon, the Japanese weapon. It was an Arasaki uh, rifle, and he didn't have any bullets in it. So he was coming at me with a bayonet, and I was able to uh, keep from getting worked over with that bayonet by just being able to shoot at him. Now, I had a pistol, forty-five pistol. That was my own personal weapon because the Marine Corps, being treated like stepchildren, didn't have enough to buy or to get pistols. So I would have gone in without a gun at all. And I wrote to my mom and told her I needed a pistol. I need a Colt 45. Now, my mom was poor. She was raising six kids. And I went all over San Antonio and south and a part of California. I couldn't find a weapon anywhere to buy. And so when my mother took up the task of finding me one, she went to uh, all the gun stores in town and finally wound up at a trailer house close to the airport and she went in and said, do you have a Colt 45? He said, I sure do. It's still in Cosmolines. And she said, how much is it? He said, $200. And she said, well, I can't afford, can't afford that. He said, how much do you have? And she said, I have only $75. And, uh, and of course, he wasn't going to accept that. When she left the trailer house and was walking down the street, and that gunsmith come running down our tour and said, why do you want a pistol? That's a big pistol. Why do you want one that big and heavy? He said, well, my son needs it. He's in the Marine Corps, and he needs a pistol. He said, come on, ma'am. I can do business with you. She went back, he cleaned up the thing with, from Cosmoline, 
and gave it to her. And then she got on a bus to go to San Diego to bring me that pistol. It took her 36 hours to get from Odessa, Texas to San Diego. What was happening in those days, a bus or train right there would move along their route and if a military man needed a spot on the place, a person, non-military, would be bumped. And, they, and she crisscrossed across uh, New Mexico and Arizona and finally got to San Diego. Well, I was on a sea bag detail with my buddy, Cobber Arch, and we was on a train, uh, on a truck. I was on top sleeping as we went out the gate and Cobber was, my buddy was in the cab with the driver right there. So we went out to the gate, stopped to check out and, uh, and my mom was with, uh, with the guard at the gate. He said, is there a Marine on there named Harvey? And Cobber said, yes, there's a person. He woke me up and there my mom was down looking at me. And she'd been on the road for 36 hours, and she was dead tired. So she got in a uh, truck with a driver, and Cobber got up there with me on the sea bags, and we started looking for a place for my mom to uh, stay in. We tried all the hotels, motels, and everything was filled up. And this was around... Oh, 12.30 or 1, and we still hadn't found a place. And I went over to a policeman. I said, sir, can you tell me where there's a place to have my mother bedded down for the night? He said, well, I just don't know of a place at all. And so uh, we turned and walked away, and he came back and said, why do you need a place? this time of night. And I said, well, Mom, my mom is here. She's tired and she needs a place to stay. He said, well, I'm going to call my wife. If your mom doesn't mind sleeping at my home, I'll fix it up to get get her there. So he called the, the station, his police station, and they sent out a car and he took him and the officer took me and the officer's mom to his home and gave her a place to stay. Now, his son had joined the Navy, and so they had an extra bed. So she spent two nights with them. And then uh, my sergeant one morning said, you better get your mom on a bus and send her home because you've got to leave. And my sergeant, Ott Ferris, he was a top sergeant, so he gave her a letter that would put her, put her on the bus, and once she got a ticket, she didn't, couldn't be put off until she got home. That's the way I got my weapon. That's amazing. So what else after, you, you mentioned that you had to shoot the, the Japanese soldier with your Colt 45. What else comes to mind immediately about your combat on Iwo Jima? Well, you know, I, I work with the uh, Nimitz Museum in Fredericksburg, Texas. They send me out to do a lot of talking to high school groups, uh, all kinds of service clubs and so forth. Anybody that wants to listen to me, they take me there and, and uh, let me talk. And I go in and I tell a group, I want them to ask any question they want to about, because I don't, I've never had a nightmare about the fighting or anything, and I can take anything that you throw at me and, and give you an answer on it. Now, my mom was a Comanche Indian. She was tough. I had seven sisters, and the Japanese were easy after <laughs> growing up with seven sisters. They would actually fist fight with me, and it was, it was really something. I loved them all, but man, sometimes I would. 
we lived in the countryside and there weren't any boys to run around with so I had to spend my time playing with my sisters and and a lot of times we were playing games you know that I would cheat on and they, they just gang up on and wipe me out what was your toughest moment on Iwo Jima well you know I was scared anytime I went into action I was really scared and that fear is what saved me. My sergeant, my uh, officer, Ralph Hall, I was there running and they told me, he said, I was talking to him one day and I said, I'm afraid of, when we get into action, I might be scared and not do good. And he said, that fear is going to save you. I said, well, how is that? And he said, when you're scared or fear, Fear fills your brain with adrenaline and your muscles with adrenaline and you think faster and clearer. And that was what saved me. One night, I gave my pistol, uh, I was in a hole. Now we didn't call them foxholes, they were just holes. And we didn't have to dig them like we did down in the South Pacific. The Army and the Navy and the Air Force put a lot of foxholes all up and down Iwo Jima for us. They'd drop bombs and it would be a big nice hole just to, just to spend the night in. And we had orders, don't leave that place for any reason. And so during the night, this sergeant said, Harvey, let me have your pistol because that's a, and he said, and I told him because it was an ideal if anybody showed up, he would shoot. Now, we were always given the instructions, both in the islands when I was first over there and second time. Don't leave your hole for any reason and shoot anything that's walking out of the hole. Now, at Iwo, you had to lay down something to sleep on. It was either cardboard boxes wood or anything that we could find, you know. We could lay on that and then put the poncho over the top of us. Now, if you lay flat on the cinder in on the Evo, you would get scalded. So you had to have something to lay on. Then you'd put a poncho over you to hold that heat in there to keep from getting cold because it was cold at Evo at night. And... Uh, I was, I, I let him have my pistol, and uh, during the night, I heard two, th three fast shots right close to me. So I jumped up, and my sergeant, I'm not going to give you his name, I said, what happened? He said, we got company. And so I was looking around, and the sergeant and the other guy was in the hole, I don't know what happened to them. What we usually did there in those big holes is build a berm right there. And one guy would be over here, another guy would be on this side of the berm, and then the guy on the watch would be uh, in the middle of that uh, deal above the berm right there. Well, I, when I jumped up, I didn't have a weapon in my hand because the sergeant had taken my pistol and gone somewhere. I, don't, I never did find out where, where he went or what happened to him or the other guy in that deal. Well, I was experienced, and as I was standing there, I was scared. I was just really scared. Fear ran, ran through me. And I heard the thump. And I knew that this Japanese was going to throw a hand grenade at me. The Japanese hand grenade was a hand grenade that you had to use a thump like that to start the powder train blowing uh, to ignite the uh, main body of the uh, grenade. When I heard that thump and the experience that I had before told me that I was going to have a hand grenade to contend with. So as it came out, it looked like a cigarette butt at night, sparkles as it comes. 
And as it got closer, I was able to reach out and shovel it out of the hole, all right. And then I stood there, and I knew that Japanese was going to be smart and was experienced right there, and he wasn't going to give me that much time on the next hand grenade. And sure enough, here it came in, and I was able to touch it, but bothered it. And I kicked it. It was right under I kicked it, and it kicked back. And that did a lot of damage on my legs and my buttocks and so forth. And I fell back on the side of the, of the shell hole, and I was there, ears were ringing and throbbing and so forth. And here comes another hand grenade, and it landed right beside me. So I lifted my hips, sat on it, and my weight pushed it into that volcanic ash, and that took me out of the war. Now they talk about the sands of Iwo Jima, and I was running there for nine days, and I never did see any sand. It was all volcanic ash, and uh, so I always tried to tell people, hey, there wasn't any sand on Iwo Jima. It was volcanic ash. Sir, unfortunately our time is up, but thank you very much for your service. Thank you very much for your time today. T. Lee Fred Harvey, U.S. Marine Corps veteran of World War II and the Battle of Iwo Jima. I'm Greg Corumbus. This is Veterans Chronicles. Veterans Chronicles.